Always in motion is the future. Do you recognize that quotation? You may be able to because the words are out of natural order. It's Yoda! Before you get excited, we're not going to talk about Yoda, our Star Wars, our laser swords. Our focus for this episode is words out of natural order. That happens more often than we writers realize. Inversion. Switching up the order of words is more than Yoda and a Zen-like character device that became a gimmick. It's recognizable, though, isn't it? How can we use inversion in our own writing to create memorable writing? This episode of The Right Focus can help. Welcome to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers, newbies, and veterans, and everyone in between. We're hosted by M.A. Lee with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms, all from Writers, Inc. Books. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Each episode lasts as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, drive a short commute, or take a brisk walk. Resources and links are in the show notes. Visit us at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Now, on to this week's episode. We're presenting the whole realm of inversions in one episode. Our use may be simple, our recurring gimmicky device, which Yoda became, charming the first few times, then definitely a laugh-inducing gimmick from 24th example and on. We don't have to pepper our writing with inversions to make it stand out. Indeed, we can slide in one example or two to give a dash of spice. And most people won't even notice. They just know they like it. Let's start this episode with a stanza of a very famous poem. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Did you recognize the first stanza of Invictus by William Ernest Henley? Words have power. Writers can ensure that words have power, often by merely shifting the words out of their expected positions, reversing the sentence, or inverting it. The stanza that we began with is a declaration of an individual's self-determination. The subject is I. Notice that it occurred well into that first stanza. It's actually the opening word in the third line. Not in the first position, on the first line, not on the second, but after two strong modifying phrases. Why did Henley do this? The whole poem is about overcoming trials, tribulations, the torments of life, and our fears when contemplating the afterlife. No matter what clutch of circumstance, our bludgeonings of chance, both in stanza two, we direct our course. How do we understand our own strength of will? Only after we face the dark hellish times. The description in the first two lines, the very lines that precede the subject I. Inversions like Henley's, are subtle. Other types are much more obvious, especially when they become a gimmick. Still others capture our minds and demand that we remember them. One way to use inversion is as Henley did. We take the subject out of its normal position, opening the sentence. Basic sentence structure places subject first in the driver's seat. As with every rule in English, exceptions exist where the subject leaves the driver's seat. To take power completely away from the subject, we have to give the power of the opening sentence to other elements. We'll call them trolls, lurking for writers, waiting to take control from the subject. Modifiers, questions, the expletives here and there, and passive voice. As writers, sometimes we do want to take power away from the subject. Sometimes we want something else to take control. Say you have a character. We'll call her Marianne. Jogging along a hiking trail. A troll might jump out and seize her. One sentence could say, The trolls seized Marianne. Another sentence could say, Marianne was seized by the trolls. The first sentence gives all the power to the trolls. The second, by putting the trolls at the very back, sucks power away and gives some, but not all of it, to Marianne. Yes, yes, I know the second example is something called passive voice. That's in the list just above. I know writers are told to avoid the passive voice. Sometimes, though, sometimes, we want a subtle hint that Marianne is not powerless, so we recast the sentence, taking power away from the trolls by placing Marianne in the power subject position. 
This is another subtle way to change emphasis with sentence position. Let's look at those four subject inversions. First up, modifiers and questions. Adjectives, adverbs, don't forget the prepositional phrases. Over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. There's the subject, we, as the next to last word. Verbal phrases, the verbal participle taking a back seat, also are modifying phrases. Jogging slowly through the fog, Marianne saw a lurid object looming. In most questions, the verb is in two parts surrounding the subject. Will Marianne turn, will turn, back, or continue her morning jog? With modifiers and questions, the subject is shifted out of the immediate start position. Simple questions, like the example, keep the subject in the driver's seat. Opening modifying phrases, such as jogging slowly, also maintain subject before main verb position. Henley's first stanza, out of the night, shifts the subject far into the whole sentence, yet still maintains the subject before main verb position. These are all examples of what the grammar world calls active voice. Those of us who desire interesting and tightened writing will focus our sentences on active voice. To take power completely away from the subject, though, we turn to the two other types of subject inversions, passive voice and the expletives there and here. Let's look at passive voice first. When the actor of the sentence is in the subject position, that is, the person who does the verb. The actor keeps power. Writers want active subjects, usually. Occasionally, we want the actor to lose power. Remember our example? Trolls seized Marianne, or Marianne was seized by the trolls. The first example is active voice. The trolls do the action. They are in the dominant position of the sentence. In the second example, our focus is Marianne, our protagonist. The trolls get shoved to the back seat of the sentence, becoming the object of the preposition by. That's passive voice. The trolls have lost power. Pretty much any time your actor follows the preposition by, that is, someone who does something follows the preposition by, we create impotence and futility. Bibbo outwitted Gollum. Gollum was outwitted by Bibbo. Hannibal invaded the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was invaded by Hannibal. What about this sentence? Hannibal invaded the Roman Empire by using elephants. It uses by. Is it passive? Well, we have to ask who is the actor? Who is invading? It's Hannibal, not the elephants. Hannibal remains in the active position at the beginning of the sentence and loses no power. The fourth type of subject inversion is the expletive. There and here. Not every there is an expletive. Some uses of there or here serve as placement adverbs. There is your book is a placement adverb. The accountant is over there behind the firm. He's hiding from the trolls who took Marianne. Whenever we have there and here as an expletive, we can remove it and recast the sentence. Shakespeare's Brutus says, There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. This is pure expletive. Recast, it would read, a tide in the affairs of men leads on to fortune. I had a professor who called these expletives do-nothing. They are mere placeholders who thrust the subject into impotence. When we remove them, we immediately punch up our writing. Example, there is no sense to her words, becomes, her words are senseless. There are no hiding places from trolls, becomes, we cannot hide from trolls. Here are giants becomes, wait, that's not so easy. This here, here are giants, is a placement adverb, not an expletive. Let's still purge it. Here are giants can become giants stood among the trees, peeking over the canopies, waiting in ambush for the trolls. For the giants will free Marianne from those trolls. Now let's get to Yoda and Yoda charm. The first instantly recognizable side character from the original Star Wars trilogy was Yoda. He charmed everyone. Why did everyone immediately fasten upon him? Two reasons. All those Zen-like pronouncements and his inverted sentences. This one a long time have I watched. And our opening, always in motion, is the future. After his charming introduction came all of those comic takeoffs on his Zenny inversions, easy mimicry. While some of his pronouncements sounded like truth, many became little more than gimmick. We have subtle inversion 
as well. The opening stanza from Invictus is a perfect example of using sentence structure to convey meaning. We also have inversions that change the normal order of words, not just the subject. The fancy Greek term for this kind of inversion is anastrophe, from ana meaning back, and strephan meaning to turn or to wind in the Proto-Indo-European language. Anastrophe is the deliberate reversal of words from normal order. Emily Dickinson wrote, Yet know I how the heather looks. That's inverted. Without the inversion is, Yet I know how the heather looks. Not unusual. Nothing to stand out. Henley In his fourth stanza, writes, It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. That's two inversions. He could easily have said, It doesn't matter how the gate is narrow or how the scroll is filled with punishments. Dickinson's third line comes from I never saw a moor. As with any structural device, anastrophe requires the reader to consider the reason for the alteration from the norm. I never saw a moor, I never saw the sea, yet know I how the heather looks, and what a billow be. I never spoke with God, nor visited in heaven, yet certain am I of the spot, as if the checks were given. With anastrophe in both stanzas, Dickinson presents us with simple ideas about using the mind's eye to travel. Through the inversion, we now realize she is talking about the power of imagination in comprehending life and the afterlife. Let's return to Invictus and that opening last stanza. Henley inverts the opening lines. He returns to normal sentence structure for the last two lines, their meaning becoming very powerful. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Henley also packs even more power with the biblical allusions of the straight gate and the lamb scroll. He could easily have used narrow, how narrow the gate, and filled with, how filled with punishments, those biblical allusions match with Henley's march through the trials of life and the tribulations of afterlife. We writers consider each word, especially we do, in poetry. As Henley's persona is the captain of our own soul, we're the captain of our own writing. My favorite type of inversion is the chiasmus. Here's a quote from Abraham Lincoln. See if you can spot what a chiasmus is. People who like this sort of thing will find this the sort of thing they like. The words are repeated in reverse order. That mirror effect leads to truth. Shakespeare is our master. From the witches who ensnare Macbeth in their evil, fair is foul, foul is fair. The three witches tempted Macbeth to change his perception. What he had formerly accepted as good became evil to him. What was evil before, murder, became good. The famous chiasmus from the play captures this inverted perception. Chi is the Greek letter that looks like an X. Draw an X on paper. At the top, write fair as foul. Beneath the X, write foul as fair. And you see how the X is made with the cross. The chiasmus is set up on that X pattern when you pair up the lines one above the other. Dr. Seuss gives us, I am Sam, Sam I am. The most famous literary chiasmus comes to us from John Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, Beauty is Truth, Truth Beauty. Here's John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Mankind must put an end to war, or war will put an end to mankind. Look around with awareness, and the world is filled with chiastic structure. Plan your work for today and every day, then work your plan. That's Norman Vincent Peale. Sometimes that's accredited to Margaret Thatcher. Disraeli said, Action may not always bring happiness, but there is no happiness without action. Oscar Hammerstein in Cinderella, which I prefer over the Disney version. Do I love you because you're beautiful? Or are you beautiful because I love you? Here's a modern proverb. Never let a fool kiss you or kiss a fool. Besides, I never saw more. Emily Dickinson used chiasmus in two other poems. We passed the setting sun or rather, he passed us, from because I could not stop for death. Much madness is divine sense to a discerning eye. Much sense, the starkest madness, from her, much madness is divine sense. And this wonderful bit of dialogue from Nanny McPhee. Nanny says, when you need me, but don't want me, I must stay. When you want me, but don't need me, I must go. The chiasmus often works as inverted opposition. Want, need, stay, go. Here's Winston Churchill. 
This is not the end. This is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. That's from his speech after the Battle of Egypt on 10th November 1942. With many more examples in prose and poetry, I can safely claim that I am not alone in my love of chiasmus. We can go as far as to have chiastic structure, but that gets confusing when you read aloud. I detail that out in my book, Discovering Sentence Craft. We can take inversion too far, and then like Yoda will sound, that gimmick from the Star Wars franchise gave us an immediately identifiable and highly likable character. By now, however, the anastrophe has become cliché, and clichés must we avoid. Find creative ways to use anastrophe, as Emily Dickinson, Shakespeare, and Oscar Hammerstein did. Our readers will be happily surprised and thankful. Our question is, can inversions help us or hinder us? The answer is yes, both. That's it on inversions. Remember to keep a light touch with any and all use of enhancements. Next week, we enter another structure of sentence craft, the realm of repetition. It's not as easy as you think. Inspiration for this week comes from C. Day Lewis. We do not write in order to be understood. We write in order to understand. Thanks for listening to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by Emma Lee from Writers Inc. Books, assisted by Remy Black and Edie Rooms. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Music is licensed through Audio Jungle called Background Music Loop. Its creator is Alexander Polishchuk, known on Audio Jungle as Plastic 3. The music comes in different iterations. Show notes and resource links for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at winkbooks at aol.com when you have questions, comments, and speculations. We will try to answer you as quickly as possible. By the way, we will not mind your email address. That's rude. If you find value in our content, 